Welcome, Center on the Legal Profession community members and practice readers. I'm Dana Walters. I'm Associate Editor of The Practice. I'd like to thank everyone for being readers of The Practice and engaging with the community we're building here. I'm here with David Wilkins. He is the Lester Kissel Professor of Law, the Director of the Center on the Legal Profession, and the Vice Dean for Global Initiatives on the Legal Profession at Harvard Law School. He's going to reflect with me today and offer some guidance on what's to come. The last two years have been challenging and the legal profession has not been untouched. We at the Center on the Legal Profession have been studying these changes as well as writing about them in the practice. David, I'm going to ask you a few questions, both to get you to reflect on what's occurred as well as to ask you if you can try to answer the question, what's coming up next? So I'd like to start with, uh, for some time now, you've been talking about what you call the three S's. That's sustainability, social justice, and stakeholders. Could you reflect on these themes, both where and how they've emerged in the legal profession in the last year? And in particular, why should lawyers care about them? Thank you, Dana. And thank you to the readers of the practice and anyone else who is tuning into this. It's uh, engagement with this community of lawyers uh, is why we started this uh, digital magazine and, and why we do the work that we do. So thank you very much. Uh, listen, this is a, a, a profound question you've asked and I'll only be able to scratch the surface here, but as we all know, uh, we've just gone through 18 months of really some of the most amazing times, uh, you know, that any of us can remember in which we've been uh, dealing with a, a global public health crisis, a increasingly complex global economic crisis, and, and uh, a growing calls for social and racial justice. Um, and these things really have turbocharged uh, a set of issues that were really already going on before March 2020, uh, but have really been accentuated by the pandemic and the protests and everything that's gone along with it. And just for shorthand, I like to refer to these things as the three S's, that is uh, stakeholders. We've seen uh, great companies and business organizations increasingly focusing attention or at least talking about the fact that they owe obligations, not just uh, to their shareholders and certainly not just to short-term value, but to really all the constituents that they touch, their employees, uh, their customers, their suppliers, the communities in which they live. Um, and that this in turn has been prompted by a growing interest in sustainability. Uh, again, before the crisis, we already saw major investors like BlackRock talking about how they were going to switch their investments to companies that uh, could promise sustainable development. We've all seen the results of climate change really every place uh, that we look. And as I said, all of this now is being viewed through the lens of social justice. Um, from the deaths of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor uh, to many, many uh, uh, folk, uh, many, many people drawing attention to economic inequality uh, in the way in which healthcare is administered, in which the economic impacts of COVID have been felt. Why is this important for lawyers? Because every single one of these issues is falling on the desk of lawyers somewhere, whether those are in house lawyers and companies who are trying to figure out how to navigate uh, the kind of new legislation and new requirements that are growing out of an emphasis on stakeholders, sustainability and social justice, or government lawyers who are trying to figure out how to create sensible regulatory policy in these areas, or uh, lawyers in private law firms who are trying to advise clients about these complex uh, issues. Uh, or law professors and law students who are trying to think about how to craft careers in this area. So uh, these are going to be, I think, the defining features of the middle decades of the 21st century, uh, long after the current emergencies end. And that's why we've chosen to devote a number of issues of the practice and a number of research projects at the center around these questions and why we look so forward to engaging with our uh, readers and with the profession as a whole 
on what's going on in these important areas. Thank you, David. That was a perfect response. I'd like to turn now uh, to a related, related note. Uh, a recurring theme of the practice this year has been changes in the delivery of legal services. For instance, we've explored ideas such as legal technology and innovation, integration in legal services, and the big four, and questions about how one measures quality in the legal profession. How are you thinking about these issues and what should the profession be doing or know about to remain competitive? Dana, not surprisingly, these issues are related. That the big changes that we have seen in the world around uh, sustainability, stakeholders, and social justice uh, are driving a new approach or turbocharging new approaches, I should say, to the delivery of legal services. Because the problems that lawyers are confronting, again, whether in companies or private practice or government or public interest law, are ones that we know are raising new and important legal issues. But law is only a part, and oftentimes not the most important part, of what the solutions to those issues will be. And therefore, lawyers are being driven to think about the services they provide as part of an integrated solution for their clients, for society, even for their own institutions uh, around these critical issues. And in order to do that requires innovation in every sense of the word, innovation in how we think about things and the way in which we approach things and the way in which we design our institutions. But it also requires innovation in terms of the processes and practices that we use to do our work. Uh, digital transformation has been transforming everything about our world. Uh, it's come to the market for legal services and the practice for lawyers. Uh, as you know, in one of the issues of the practice where we talked about the kind of priorities of CEOs for what they're looking for in the legal function, getting a more data-driven uh, approach to risk and risk management was at the core, which is then driving what general counsels are looking for from their own departments, from their outside law firms, and this is just uh, one example of how technology is going to reshape, is reshaping the way in which we think about law and legal services. Um, so we're moving into a world in which lawyers are going to have to become much more fluent in understanding the role of technology and the integration of law with other disciplines in order to solve the complex pro problems of clients. Doesn't mean everyone needs to learn how to code or that everyone will be a data scientist or that everyone has to have a, a, you know, a degree in economics or sociology or computer science, but it does mean that lawyers are going to have to learn how to work much more collaboratively across disciplinary boundaries, across different kinds of mediums of, uh, of knowledge and information flow in order to uh, help their clients and again, society as a whole and their own institutions uh, in meeting the challenges of the middle decades of the 21st century. Thank you, David. That was a perfect segue to the next question I have about the changing nature of work. Uh, it's no secret that we are experiencing something the media is calling the great resignation and the legal profession has not been spared. We're all reflecting more about what work means and what skills are necessary to succeed and compete in this atmosphere. Could you talk about the changing nature of work? For instance, in the practice, we've discussed the changing nature of careers and the types of skill sets needed to thrive as a 21st century legal professional. As you know, we've explored this in issues such as crisis lawyering and legal informatics, as well as CLP research that explores new, the new demands of legal departments, among others. Could you both reflect on these themes in the context over what has happened the last couple of years, 
as well as how you see them evolving over the next year, three years, and beyond? Well, Dana, if I really knew the answer to that question, I'd be a very wealthy person. Uh, this is the question everyone is asking. Uh, listen, uh, I used to have to persuade lawyers that, you know, remote work was even possible <laughs> and that, you know, uh, you didn't have to be in the office not just five days, but seven days a week in order uh, to, do, to be a competent lawyer. Uh, you know, for the last 18 months, we've all been living our lives on Zoom and nobody thinks that we're going to go back to the old ways of working uh, even after this horrible pandemic is brought under control. And people who did live under that delusion were quickly uh, reminded that that's, this was not the case when some people said, well, of course, you know, by September 1, everybody is going to be in the office full time. And if they're not in the office full time, they're not going to get my business. That has all changed. And in part, it's changed because over these last 18 months, people have had a time to reflect on what's important in their lives, what is uh, meaningful to them, and how they want to spend their time. And that has resulted in many people across every single uh, industry or profession deciding that they were going to make changes. And certainly law, as you say, has not been exempt from this phenomenon. In fact, the very thing that we love about lawyers is they're smart, they're reflective, and they have options and that is what we have seen more and more. And so every employer uh, and every person interested in the legal profession is going to have to think about how do we uh, make a value proposition that is meaningful to today's talent. And I'll just say one more thing that's changed that sort of got lost in the shuffle of 2020 and all the things that happened. It was the first year that Gen Z's graduated from college. Uh, and we talked about millennials for a long time, but Generation Z's are now entering the workplace. And we know, roughly speaking, that they're millennials on steroids. And that all of the issues that millennials cared about are even more meaningful to this generation, in part because they have lived through the last 18 months. That means we're going to have to talk a lot more about meaning and purpose, about what the meaning is of what we do and why we do it and why it's important and why it's related to important issues that this generation cares about. Frankly, I think we have a very important story to tell about that because law is, as I said earlier, integrally related to all of the important problems in the world today. But we need to make those connections stronger and more credible. And then we need to equip lawyers with the skills that they will need to address these issues, which of course, means we continue to need to train lawyers in you know, great legal technical skills. But as my colleague Ben Heineman and I have written on several occasions, they have to be more than that. They have to learn how to be not just technical experts, but wise counselors and courageous leaders. That means in addition to teaching technical legal skills, we also need to provide lawyers with what we call the complementary competencies that will allow them to be able to understand and tackle the problems today. Uh, you know, information fluency, right? Financial literacy, uh, global understanding, cross-cultural uh, skills. Uh, problem solving skills, teamwork skills. We need to think about making lawyers terrific problem solvers so that they can engage with the most important issues today. And if we do that, I think we will continue to see many of the best and the brightest want to become lawyers. And perhaps just as important, see people in other fields 
recognize the importance of working with lawyers on these important issues of the day. Well, since you sound so upbeat and optimistic, I want to end on a positive note. Um, and I'd like to ask you this one last question. What are you hopeful for in the next year, David? Well, my view is, you know, you can either go through laugh, life laughing or crying. I prefer the former to the latter because life will make you cry enough as it is. But I have to say, Dana, that um, I'm even more hopeful uh, after this past semester. I just finished teaching both of my classes. And I'll tell you, I was nervous about what this semester was going to be like with students teaching in masks, what it was going to be like, given all the things that have been going on. And I have to say, I came away from this uh, semester so impressed with the engagement and intelligence and commitment of the young people that I'm privileged enough uh, to teach here at Harvard Law School. And my sense is this is being replicated really all around the world. Um, I said to my students on the last day of class that this experience uh, that they have all just lived through is going to test them the way that the Great Depression and World War II tested my parents' generation, uh, which means they this is going to be a defining feature of their lives. It's going to define everything that they do. But if you look at what that generation did, my parents' generation, there's a reason why we call them the greatest generation. Because they not only conquered the depression, won World War II defeating fascism, but then they created the new world order, the international monetary system. They created the modern human rights movement, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement the environmental movement. This was a generation that took the challenges that it faced and used them as motivation to do great things to make a better world. I believe this generation is capable of this same kind of greatness. And I look forward uh, to watching what they do from these challenges and hopefully being a small part of providing through the practice and through our research and through the teaching that we do here, some tools for them to do the important work to come. Well, thank you, David. Uh, I certainly hope that as well. Uh, I hope everyone uh, watching has a wonderful end of the year. If you haven't yet subscribed to the practice, please visit our website, both to learn how you can get your own individual subscription, uh, as well as an institutional subscription for your law firm or your university. Um, please stay tuned for new issues in the new year on topics like election lawyers and global disability lawyers and more, and uh, we will see you in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dana, and thanks to our readers, and happy, happy holidays, and a, and a joyous and better new year to all. Thank you.